Well, good evening again, and welcome to the annual town meeting in Wilton. I'm Bill Brennan, first selectman for the town, and I would like to call this meeting to order. Now, our first order of business is to elect a moderator for this evening. May I have a nomination? Thank you. Do we have a second? Are there any other nominees? Could you repeat the nomination, please? Yes, Mr. Bob Russell has been nominated and seconded to be the moderator for the evening. No further nominees. We'll close the floor to nominations. All those in favor of electing Bob Russell as moderator for tonight's meeting, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Carried unanimously. Bob? Thank you. It was close there for a minute. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of different things tonight. We're going to ask people to sign up ahead of time if they wish to make a comment. Uh, I believe this was done at the public hearings a month or so ago. And so if you're uh, already inclined to make a comment during the discussion period, uh, you should sign up outside and we'll take people in that sequence. Um, I was prepared with a long discussion on Wilton history, but I think I'll confine it to one little mention. In the town clerk's vault, there's an amazing amount of Wilton history. And if you go back to number one book of the land records, where it records the first town meeting in 1802, one of the important things that they had to do there was to record the earmarks for the livestock. Because many people had livestock that just wandered wild throughout the town. So your cattle or sheep or whatever had to have a distinctive earmark. And you didn't want to have the same earmark as your neighbor. You wanted to have a distinctive earmark. So they kept a record. There are 150 names in that list in the back of Land Record Book 1 of earmarks. And they'll talk about a cut at the lower of the right ear or a wedge-shaped cut at the top or a diamond-shaped cut in the middle. All kinds of distinctive marks on the ears of the livestock. So it's kind of fun reading sometimes. If you don't have anything to do, you can go in and pull out volume one of the land records and there it is. Okay, my first duty is to appoint the parliamentarian, that as Ken Bernard, town council, appoint, to appoint him as parliamentarian. Thank you. Next duty is Betty Ragnetti, town clerk, will read the call to the meeting. All electors of the town of Wilton and all others called entitled to vote in the meeting of the town meeting pursuant to the general statutes are hereby notified that the annual town meeting of the town of Wilton will be held in the Bloom Center Auditorium, Wilton High School, Wilton, Connecticut, on Tuesday, May 3rd, 2011, at 7.30 p.m. to consider and act upon the following matter. The annual budget and tax levy for the town of Wilton set forth below and submitted by the Board of Finance the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2011, and to make specific appropriations as are advisable and authorized by law. Dated Wilton, Connecticut, this 21st day of April, 2011. William F. Brennan, first selectman. Susan A. Lucy, second selectman. Harold E. Clark, Richard F. Creed, Ted Hofstede, selectman. Thank you, Betty. Next, we'll ask Ken Bernard to give some procedural resolutions or a couple of procedural resolutions and to make remarks on the annual budget. Ken? Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have a, a couple of procedural resolutions that uh, I would move. Uh, I move that, that, that it be resolved that the parliamentary procedure for this annual town meeting shall be governed first by the Roberts uh, Rules of Order and furthermore, it, um, I would move that the following resolution be adopted, that there be a time limitation on speaker's time to three minutes for each person addressing the town meeting on a given issue. Uh, I would move that these uh, resolutions uh, 
govern uh, tonight's uh, procedures. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Is there a discussion? All those in favor, say, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, uh, motion carries. I have some remarks with regard to the adoption of the budget. With regard to the adoption or the rejection of the budget items, if this town meeting, which concludes the continued vote on Saturday, may do the following. One, approve the budget as recommended by the Board of Finance. Two, reject the budget. Three, reduce and approve the reduced budget. Or four, reduce and, re and reject the reduced budget. There are some things the meeting cannot do. This town meeting may not appropriate more money than the Board of Finance has recommended for a particular line item. Appropriate money for any purpose not recommended by the Board of Finance and represented by a line item. Reduce any line item below the town's legal obligation to pay for the operation of goods or services represented by a particular line item. No reduction in a line item shall be applied to create an increase in another line item, and reductions must be specific dollar amounts addressed to a particular line item within the budget. The Board of Education's budget is one line item within the budget. The debt service, the selectman's budget, and capital budget comprise the other line items, and each line within those categories is a line item within the budget. Voting procedures. The Charter of the Town of Wilton states that upon conclusion of all reasonable discussion on the proposed budget, as determined by the moderator, a machine vote will be taken following the adjournment of this meeting in the Clune Center foyer. The polls will reopen, reopen for a continued vote on Saturday, May 7, 2011, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. here in the Clune Center. Each voter shall have the following choices. Approve the budget, reject the budget because it is too high, reject the budget because it is too low. <coughs> to determine the outcome of the vote, all rejection votes shall be added together and the total weight against the total votes for the exception of acceptance of the budget. You may vote by absentee ballot if you are out of town during the polling hours. Absentee ballots for tonight's annual meeting uh, vote on the budget, which will be continued on Saturday, May 7th, will be available on Wednesday, May 4th, uh, through the, uh, the afternoon of Friday, May 6th, in the town clerk's office between the hours of 8 a.m., 8.30, excuse me, 8.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. The reason the absentee ballots will not be available prior to May 4th is that the budget cannot be amended tonight. Therefore, the question is not finalized and absentee voters will not know on what they are voting until after tonight's meeting. Unlike regular election ballots, a designee may be issued a ballot for another person who is a member of his or her family or for whom the person is acting or is caring because of illness or disability. However, the application must first be signed by the applicant. The absentee ballots must be returned to the town clerk's office in person by mail or by the next designee no later than Friday, May 6, 2011, at 4.30 p.m. If the budget is rejected by the annual town meeting vote by a simple majority of at least 15% of the electorate of the town, an adjourned annual town meeting shall be reconvened in the Board of Finance following consultation with the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Education shall submit a reconsidered budget. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I wish you all good night. Sorry. Uh, and good luck. Not so fast. Yeah, not so fast on the good night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're now going to hear some budget presentations from the Board of Finance, the Board of Selectmen, and the Board of Education, and we'll hold the discussion until all of those presentations have been made. So first, I'd like to get, ask Warren Sarenbitz, Chairman of the Board of Finance. Thank you, Bob. As Bob said, I'm a little taller than that. As Bob said, my name is Warren Sarenbitz. I'm Chairman of the Board of Finance. Good evening to you all. 
Uh, with me tonight are Al Alper, uh, Lynn Vanderslice, who is Vice Chairman of the Board, and Jim Meinhold, who is Clerk of the Board. Uh, Andy Forsheimer is in Atlanta on business, and Gail Laviel is up in Hartford uh, doing battle on the budget till probably the wee hours of this morning. The first slide, please. Let's start with the uh, fiscal year 12 budget highlights. The tax increase is being set at 3.42%. The grand list is only growing at 0.46%, continuing the trend lower over the last several years. After adjustments by the BOF, the Board of Selection budget, including operating capital, is up 3.37%, and the Board of Ed budget is up 3.54%. The fiscal year 12 general fund balance is being set at 10.8%, which is 10% of operating requirements plus an amount to be used for future operating capital, which we've uh, put into offset the money that went into debt service, which I'll get to in a minute. Due to expected positive fiscal year 11 uh, operating results, this will enable us, enable us to reduce the tax increase by $2.2 million by drawing down the general fund from expected year-end 2011 levels. Uh, recently, um, I mean, October or so of last year, Moody's reaffirmed our AAA bond rating. This is important because it keeps the cost of debt service low, and while we don't have any capital projects on the board for uh, this year, we have uh, quite a significant number of them coming up uh, in the following year. So having, uh, being able to borrow at, at the lowest possible rate is very important. Tax relief for the elderly and disabled is being set at $875,000, $25,000 higher than the fiscal year 11 budget with the understanding that additional funds, up to a total of $100,000 more, will be allocated if there is a need due to uh, the applications that we get uh, by the end of this month. Next slide. This slide highlights the major sources of revenue and spending for fiscal year 12. Let's look at spending first. The first two items are the Board of Ed and Board of Selectmen budgets mentioned earlier. You will hear more about these from Mr. Brennan and Mr. Bray. The decrease in debt service is due to our ability to use funds bonded and unspent on previous capital projects. This is a one-time benefit which will not repeat beyond fiscal year 12 and is the reason why we allocated additional monies in the general fund for future capital spending. The Charter Authority is a source of funding for emergencies and non-budgeted spending that might occur during the year and the amount is set by town charter. And in fact, fiscal year 11 was the first year in quite a while that we actually had to uh, use some of that for a couple of emergency projects. After adding the uh, tax relief for the elderly, the sum of those expense items results in a 3.16% increase over the fiscal year 11 budget. Now on the revenue side, we see that non-tax revenues are growing at a modest 2.6%. This is primarily a reflection of uh, the excess cost grant going up. There are some other items which go in the other direction, uh, but uh, that's the primary reason. As I indicated in the highlights, we will use 2.2 million from the general fund balance to reduce the total taxes to be funded from property tax, which results in a 4% increase before we apply changes to the grand list. Applying the 0.46% increase in the grand list and a 99.3% collection rate will end up with a 3.42% mill rate increase. The collection rate was increased from 99.2% in the fiscal year 11 budget reflecting our best estimates of the expectations for this fiscal year and next based on what we've been seeing uh, year to date in action. Next slide. <clears throat> this next slide uh, puts the fiscal year 12 uh, mill rate in an 11, uh, 11 year perspective. The uh, mill rate required increase for the previous five years has averaged about 2.9%. Fiscal year 12 will be slightly higher than that average, reflecting the Board of Finance's belief that cutting spending further than this uh, this uh, coming year 
would uh, be more pain than taxpayers or whole were willing to endure. Next slide, please. This chart breaks down town spending by category. You can see that the education budget is the biggest slice of the pie at about 65%. Public safety is next at 11%. Debt service is 7.5%, and this is actually a very good number. We try, we, you know, our, our goal is to keep debt service under 10%, and we're looking at quite a few projects coming up in the next few years. So what this tells us will be a lot of room to move to be able to fund uh, those projects. Public works at 4.1%, our public-private partnerships at 3.4%, and all other, which you can see the note on there, includes parks and rec. Uh, land use, town clerk, etc. at 9.7%. Uh, Next slide. Let's look at how the proposed spending compares over time. The Board of Ed and uh, Board of uh, Selectmen spending increases this year 11 to 12 are slightly higher than their four-year annual average rate of change, but significantly below the longer-term average. Debt service has been dropping as we have not had any big capital projects for several years and in fact have been returning unused funds in that category as I mentioned earlier. But uh, as I said again, this is good because of the upcoming capital needs that we're looking at. So that's uh, an overview of how uh, we got to the 3.42% mill rate increase. And I will now turn the podium over to uh, Bill Brennan to uh, Thank you, Warren, and uh, good evening again. I'm Bill Brennan, first selectman for the town of Wilton. And before presenting the Board of Selectmen's budget proposal, let me introduce my Board of Selectmen colleagues. On my left, Susan Bruschi, second selectwoman, Richard Kreef, Hal Clark, and Ted Hofstadter. As the economic recession has been severe and the recovery slow, economic stress has continued in our community. This was certainly evident from many personal comments made by citizens at the Board of Finance's public hearings at the end of March. Now please be assured that the Board of Selectmen and town officials are keenly aware of the current economic environment and to respond set very basic objectives for the development of the fiscal year 12 budget and the management of the town. Slide, please. Let me quickly review our objectives. Manage the town government cost efficiently by continuing to reduce operating expenditures within our control in order to maintain essential services to the community. Closely manage capital facility planning with the Board of Ed and the Board of Finance. We support essential equipment and vehicle replacements. And we must maintain our town roads, buildings, school facilities, and other assets. And lastly, we must protect the health and safety of Wilton citizens. Slide, please. Here are the total Board of Selectmen budget numbers for fiscal year 12. As you may, may remember, last year the Board of Selectmen final operating and capital budget after all changes was just plus 1.1% over the fiscal year 10 budget. We were able to do that last year by negotiating a wage freeze with four town unions as well as all non-union employees, an accomplishment unmatched by any other Connecticut municipality. In addition, operating expenditures were substantially reduced or deferred to produce a historically low year-over-year -year increase. For fiscal year 12, operating expenditures are up plus 3.1%, reflecting required contractual wage increases versus no increases this year, as well as benefit and energy increases, which I will discuss in a later slide. Operating capital requested is $1.4 million, up $200,000 versus last year, but within the traditional range experienced over the last five years. Board of Selectmen believes it is not possible or prudent to defer indefinitely 
necessary equipment replacement purchases of trucks, police cars, lawn mowers, computers, computers, and many other things. In summary, operating and capital requests represent a 3.4% increase versus fiscal year 11. Slide. This chart compares the proposed budget of $29.8 million versus the Board of Selectmen adopted budget for the last six years. The blue segment of the bars represents operating expenditures, and the green segment reflects operating capital, which as noted earlier, has been fairly consistent over this period of time. Next slide. This pie chart illustrates our proposed operating budget by expenditure. As pointed out in previous budget presentations, town employees' compensation and benefits account for approximately 68% of the total town budget. This segment is down slightly from the last year due to the employee salary freeze this year. All the other segments are proportionally the same, with only minor changes in the mix versus the fiscal year 11 budget. Now this chart illustrates the Board of Selectmen's operating capital request for police cars, trucks, lawnmowers, and other equipment over the last six years, which as I indicated, averages approximately $1,300,000 per year. However, due to budget and economic pressures, we've had to stretch the life of some equipment. But as we all know, deferrals of aging equipment cannot continue indefinitely. This slide takes a look at a three-year profile of Board of Selectmen operating and capital budgets compared on a budget-to-budget -budget basis. As you will note, the fiscal year 10's final budget was lower than the fiscal year 09 budget. Fiscal year 11 was up 1.1%, and our fiscal year 12 budget request is up 3.4%. Consequently, the average increase is approximately 1.2% per year on a budget-to-budget -budget basis. Slide please. <coughs> Comparing actual expenditures each year over the same period, fiscal year 09 actual expenditures were up 3.46% over fiscal year 08 actual expenditures. Fiscal year 10 actual expenditures were up 2.37% over fiscal year 09 actual expenditures. And for fiscal year 11, the current year, actual expenditures will not be finalized until well after June 30th, the end of the fiscal year. If we come in on budget, actual expenditures will be up 6%. However, town departments have come in under budget for the last three years, and we are striving to maintain this positive performance record, which would again lower this year's actual increase versus fiscal year 10. Slide. Therefore, I believe the key question is, why is the Board of Selectmen's operating budget up 3.1% for the fiscal year 12 budget year? The answer is focused on three cost areas that, that account for 85% of the year-over-year -year increase. First, increased employee compensation costs. Last year we had a salary freeze, and this year we are contractually obligated to increase employee compensation. I will comment on this further in some later slides. Second, increased medical insurance costs and pension contribution. And third, not surprisingly, increased utility and fuel costs. More again on these costs in the next slide. To, exa to examine these cost areas in more detail, let's first look at the major year-over-year -year expenditure variances. Projected employee wages and contractual obligations account for an increase of approximately $260,000, which represents a 2% uh, increase versus fiscal year 11. Next, employee benefits are up collectively $321,000, or about 4.7% versus last year. Social Security, Medicare taxes are up 
$21,000 or plus 2.2%. Pension and other cost employee benefits, OPEP. Contributions are determined by actuarial calculations, which must be funded each year and are two expenditure areas that we cannot control directly. <coughs> Pension contributions are up $129,000 or plus 5.8% versus last year. But OPED con contributions are down $97,000 or down 26%, offsetting most of the increased pension contribution. However, a big hike again this year is in medical insurance, up $217,000, a 6.9% year-over-year increase. <coughs> Unfortunately, we believe that several large employee claims in the past year neg negatively impacted this year's increase. Other increases are as follows. The library up $66,000, or 2.8%, and while utilities are up 3.8%, the biggest year-over-year -year variance, not unexpectedly, unexpectedly, is in heating oil and fuel increases, up 29.7% together. Driven primarily by recent oil increases due to the North Africa conflicts and Mideast tensions. As there has been so much negative press over the last year about government employees, high salaries, excessive pensions, and egregious union agreements, I would like to present some information about our town employees and why the Board of Selectmen support the 2% wage increase mentioned in the previous slide. First, Wilton town employees are not overpaid. An average police officer's salary is approximately $76,000 per year, an average firefighter, $71,000, and an average DPW worker, about $55,000 per year. They do not receive bonuses, and most public safety employees work shifts that include night work and are regularly called out when severe weather or storm emergencies occur. They earn their pay. Pension calculations do not include overtime, and a Wilton employee cannot pump up his or her pension by excessive hours during a final employment year. In brief, benefits are comparable to many other neighboring communities as benefit data is shared and discussed by human resource departments of each community. Now occasionally you hear a few citizens make comments such as, the town should cut employees' salaries, or they are lucky to have jobs, or no one that I know is getting a raise. Well, this year, no town employee got a raise. But in the private sector, in 2010, salary increases average plus 2.3%. This information is based on credible national surveys of mid-sized to large U.S. companies by three major compensation specialist firms, as noted in this slide. For 2011, 98% of U.S. companies reported plans to award pay increases averaging 2.8%, up slightly from the previous year's average increases of 2.3%. Therefore, projected fiscal year 12 salary increase of 2% for town employees averaged over two years is about a 1% increase per year and considerably below reported private sector compensation increases. Last point on employee compensation. Just like you and me, our employees are impacted by rising costs. Last year, Consumer Price Index Northeast Region data for February 2010 through February 2011 indicated that the cost for all items increased by 2%. Especially noteworthy is gasoline, up 18.5%, and energy up 9.8%. And additional increases have obviously occurred in March and April. These cost increases impact the town as well as our employees, many of whom commute significant distances to Wilton. In summary, the town and our employees are equally affected by rising costs of basic needs and services. Next slide, please. 
so we must continue to find additional ways to lower costs. To this objective, the town has a number of expenditure reduction projects. To offset rising medical insurance, noted in an earlier slide, for fiscal year 12, the town will combine its medical insurance plan with the Board of Ed's employees' medical self-insurance plan which is projected to provide significant long-term savings. Fire and EMS emergency dispatch for the towns of Wilton, Westport, New Canaan, and Richfield will be combined into a sing single regional dispatch center. The town's finance department has started an active project to combine town and board of ed employee payroll functions to reduce costs. Wilton and Wesson are also evaluating the combining of animal control operations. And energy reduction recommendations by consultant organizations are being implemented to produce energy cost savings in town buildings. And lastly, another very recent project, we have started discussions with Yankee Gas to encourage the extension of their gas line further up Route 7 in order to supply lower cost natural gas to town, school, and many commercial buildings. There is very, very uh, sincere interest in this uh, project by property owners in Wilton. Now let's look at the Board of Selectmen's proposed operating capital plan of $1,448,000. This year's request is up $116,000 over last year's budget. There are really few surprises. Vehicle and equipment replacements reflect normal replacement cycles for various town equipment. The replacement of six police cars was partially benefited again by utilizing police user funds generated from traffic duty while assisting contractors. Computer hardware and software replacements plus funds to start the preparation for the 2013 property revaluation re are at expected levels. Road maintenance funds are increased $25,000 to $650,000. Our roads took a beating this winter due to the severe weather conditions, and we will need every dollar of this budget to repay and make repairs. And lastly, we are required to replace various police officer and firefighter equipment at specified time intervals. In fiscal year 12, police ballistic vests and mobile data terminals replacements are scheduled. Funds to implement the fire department, EMS dispatch, regionalization, as mentioned earlier, are also included in this capital plan. Turning to the Board of Selectmen's bonded capital project, outlook over the next year, five years, please note that in fiscal year 12, there are no requests for any bonded capital. This is the second year in a row that the Board of Selectmen has not requested any bonded funds which obviously helps to reduce debt service costs. Going down the list, funds may be required in fiscal year 13 for an open space development easement. This activity relates to the same property mentioned last year. Next, fire engine replacements are scheduled for fiscal year 13 and 14. And in fiscal year 15, funds to renovate the fire station two on Route 33 will be required. Ample farm funds to renovate the interior of the White, White House have been spread over fiscal year 13 and 14, which will provide additional time to also raise required private, private funding for, the, for this project. And lastly, funds to address town hall complex facility improvements have again been deferred until a strong economic environment returns that will enable support for several overdue projects. In summary, a year-over-year -year budget increase of 3.4% has been requested. The major drivers, as pointed out in this presentation, are employee compensation increases, increased medical insurance costs, increased pension contributions, and increased energy costs. The operating capital plan includes normal vehicle and equipment replacements, road paving, hardware software requirements, start of course for the 2013 revaluation and police fire equipment. 
In closing, please be assured that the town will continue to operate as efficiently as possible to maintain essential services to the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Next, I'd like to call on Gil Bray, Chairman of the Board of Education. Thank you very much, Bob, Warren, Bill. My name is Gil Bray. I'm Chairman of the Board of Education, and with me this evening are Dick DeBow, our Vice Chairman, Dr. Gary Richards, Superintendent, Karen Burke, our Secretary, Barbara Myers, Bruce Likely, and Jim Sachs. The 2011-2012 Board of Education recommended budget is $72,777,000. This represents a 5.4, actually, I think we have on the next slide, it's a 5.4 uh, increase over the 2010-2011 budget. This represents a $1.6 million decrease from the superintendent's budget presented on December 16th to the Board of Education. Now I'd like to walk you through some of the uh, more important uh, line items that are driving our proposed increase. Salaries for existing staff are increasing by 1.2 million, which increases the proposed budget by 1.8 percent. And you'll notice that on the screen that represents 55.8 percent of the increase that we're asking for. Uh, due to a very favorable claims experience this year, we were able to decrease our medical benefits budget by 1.2 million on existing employees. We are also proposing an increase of 1.3 FTEs, full-time equivalents, for the 2011-2012 uh, budget. Uh, the next slide will provide the details. Regular education staffing is proposed to increase by 3.35 uh, full-time employees. We are proposing the increases at Middlebrook and the high school to maintain class sizes and avoid scheduling conflicts. Miller Driscoll will be reduced by 4.4 FTEs to adjust for declining enrollment and budget reductions. As you can see, the majority of the proposed FTE increases are in special education. 2.7 FTEs are to meet the IEPs, the Individual Educational Program, requirements for occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy. Adding these positions will help us control our contract and services costs. Additionally, we're adding back into the budget two existing staff members that are currently being paid by federal stimulus grant funds, which are no longer available uh, next year. This is a budget uh, impact, not a staffing impact. Now let's look at other operating costs. Transportation and utilities costs are increasing with a significant increase in diesel fuel and heating oil. Special education outplacements are increasing due to an increase in the number of students expected to be placed in private facilities rather than public facilities. As I mentioned before, the increase in special education staffing will allow us to reduce our reliance on outside providers, and therefore, we are able to reduce our contracted services costs. Facilities refurbishment costs will increase by, one, uh, by $125,000. <coughs> the facilities refurbishment plan. Out of the 21 projects originally scheduled for 2011-2012, 16 have been deferred to future years. As you can see, most of the projects that remain in the 2011-2012 proposed budget are either health or safety related or need to be completed for multi-year projects. Projects proposed for 2011-2012 are complete the Peach Core HVAC upgrade at Miller Driscoll, begin the project to re-insulate the roof duct work at Cider Mill. It's important that we begin this project to prevent a uh, very costly failure of the duct system. We need, want to begin the carpet and tile replacement project at Middlebrook. Begin and the repair and renovation of the original art rooms at the high school, which is primarily for the drains, which tend to get stopped up and could cost us quite a bit to repair. That goes into the sewage system. And the continued installation of security measures at the high school. Historically, we've tried to maintain a uh, budget of 500000 for refurbishments. The past two years' budgets have been $105,000 and $145,000, so uh, deferred maintenance projects are backing up. Now let's consider equipment and supplies. In technology, the Board of Education is proposing that we increase our technology uh, equipment purchases by $139,000. We have actually cut all instructional technology projects for the high school world, except for the high school world language lab. Uh, the current world, world language lab is outdated and virtually non-functional. 
Other non-technology equipment will increase by 113,000. This is largely maintenance equipment, equipment and classroom and cafeteria furniture. Again, these are largely items that have been deferred for many years. Let's just now switch gears from financial and consider what makes Wilton a high-performing school system. By the way of context, I believe it is important to remind ourselves that our school system has earned a reputation for excellence on many levels. An outstanding committed staff, 92% of our staff have completed advanced degrees. The depth and breadth of our curriculum in a system that serves learners at all levels. We have a wide range of course offerings that challenge all students. Our students have demonstrated a record of high academic achievement in many areas. Consistently at the highest levels on standardized assessment tests, <clears throat> Number of merit scholars, class of 2011 is nine merit finalists, and 25 commended students. College Board Advanced Placement Achievement List. We have been recognized for significant gains in advanced placement access and student performance. Our students are positively engaged and actively engaged in the life of our schools. We have award-winning academic, arts, and athletic programs. State championships in girls swimming and boys uh, skiing. FCI championships in girls cross country and gymnastics. We have one of the leading debate teams in the state and an award for music project, music programs. We are a school system that encourages students to become involved with and give back to the broader community. <coughs> Student fundraising for the Wilton Senior Center. We have had large <coughs> performance celebrations for senior citizens of Wilton High School. And what I'd like to do now is to make a sort of a plug for the following events that will be coming out for the Wilton community. On May 5th, the Jazz Night at Little Theater, 7 p.m. May 21st, the Music Man, you saw some students when you're coming in, 5 o'clock at the Clune Center. June 1st, Pops at the Clune Center, 7.30 here. I'd also like to give you a quote from uh, Chip Gall that I just read in a newsletter. Our schools are a community resource for Wiltonians of all generations, and these intergenerational programs benefit everyone involved by breaking down the stereotypes and reinforcing the true meaning of the community. The students care about this community, and I think the community cares about the students. And finally, we're a culture that promotes personal growth, teamwork, respect, civility, and caring for others. Looking at our culture, what makes us special? The culture of a school system is essential for its success. Some of the attributes of our culture include a commitment by staff, students, and parents to the growth and well-being of each student, policies and practices that are grounded in the value of student environments that support and nurture students, a belief in doing all we can for the individual as well as the group, a comprehensive program that promotes success for students of all abilities. A recognition that we are a system that what happens at one level affects other levels. That's been particularly true as we've gone through the budget process. And a long history of commitment to continuous improvement. How are our schools different than they were 10 years ago? Over the past decade, the educational landscape has changed uh, very dramatically. We've experienced increases in the number of underfunded and unfunded mandates from state and federal governments, such as SRBI, Scientific Research Based Intervention, in-school suspensions, and increased state and federal requirements. <coughs> There's been an increase in the number of students who come to us with complex learning challenges. There has been a surge in the number of students who are on the autism spectrum. Our preschool population of students with learning challenges has grown from 23 few years ago to 37 this year. We have, placed a, we have placed an increased emphasis on promoting strong skills in reading, writing, and critical thinking, particularly in the early grades, which is a foundation for future success. The use of technology as an essential tool for teaching and learning has greatly expanded over the last 10 years. Colleges and employers have expectations that our students are proficient in the use and understanding of technology. Technology is also an administrative tool. We've implemented PowerSchool, uh, IDD Direct, SubFinder, and AlertNow. On a variety of fronts, schools are being asked to do more this year. Examples of this include mandates to address cyber safety, childhood obesity, drug and alcohol abuse, and the list goes on and on. 
Obviously, all of these things that I've reviewed in the last few slides come at a cost. <coughs> I'd like to spend a few minutes now reviewing some of the many efforts we make to contain costs. I'll be talking about collaboration, energy conservation, negotiations, and structural changes. Collaboration. In cooperation with the town, we blocked in heating oil and diesel fuel from 2011 to 2012. We blocked that in the generation portion of our electric rate for several years. Uh, we competitively bid our property and li liability insurance every year. We'll be allowing the town to join the self-funded health insurance plan uh, that Bill mentioned, which is estimated to save the town up to $200,000 a year. We also participate in consortiums with other school districts to purchase supplies and materials by a competitive bid. The Board of Finance Review Committee uh, released its report a few months ago after a review of the town and board of ed purchasing procedures. Its conclusion was, and I quote, in our opinion, there is no significant financial savings to be achieved through fit shared purchasing beyond those already being pursued. Our town finance uh, officials have really done quite a good job. Energy conservation. A recent study of our electric and oil usage shows that since 2008, the Board of Education has reduced its energy consumption by 9.4%, not a small amount. Some of the actions we've taken to reduce our energy consumption include a district-wide relamping project that saves about 98,000 a year in electricity costs, installation of motion sensors in rooms and in hallways so if someone's in there, not in there, the lights are turned off, thermostat setbacks, uh, installed computer <coughs> shutoff software, well, that's a, that alone saves $45,000 a year. Negotiations. In our most recent negotiated contract, our custodians agreed to a two-year pay freeze. Our administrators and non-union employees agreed to a pay freeze in the current year. The superintendent and his cabinet-level staff have had their salaries frozen for the past two years. And over the past six years, we've negotiated a higher co pays and premium contributions for every one of our bargaining units. The custodians have also agreed to a defined contribution plan for all new hires. This plan is similar to the 401k plan. Now let's look at structural changes. We are continually looking for innovative ways to change our instructional, administrative, or operational practices that are in a way we deliver programs and services. For example, the reorganization of Miller Driscoll saves the district over $80,000 a year. The reorganization of the special education administration eliminated one administrative position saving the district $125,000. The reorganization of the high school audiovisual department eliminated one certified staff position, saving us $100,000. Restructuring special education, uh, extended school year program improves the quality and efficiency of the delivery of services. With data-driven decision-making, our teachers use testing data to develop educational programs and curriculum revisions. That focuses our teaching staff more effectively. Metrics. Are we getting value for what we spend? Data about student learning includes standardized test scores, but goes far beyond the snapshot of pictures we get from testing. Some examples are grade level assessments, student portfolios, student projects, and student presentations. We also use assessment data to inform our decisions about what to teach and how to teach. We also track how groups of students, cohorts, perform over time. This slide, uh, this slide uh, illustrates how the class of 2014, our current ninth graders, has improved since the fourth grade. Other cohort groups ahead and behind this group have shown similar results. Consistently high test scores. Whether you're talking about state tests, such as the Connecticut Mastery of CAP test, or PSAT, SAT, Advanced Placement Test, will your students score consistently among the highest in the state of Connecticut. College admissions. I'm pleased to report that 94.5% of our graduates go on institutions of higher learning, and 53% of the Wilton High School class of 2010 attended colleges and universities rated as most competitive or highly competitive by merits. Qualitative measures. We participate in best practice reviews by outside organizations like the Tri-State Commission and the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. A question of uh, similar to this was asked during uh, the board, uh, the board of finance and the board of education questions, and there's a list of about ten uh, different organizations that we work with for uh, reviewing best practices across the country. 
our students report also when they come home from Christmas and they uh, come and they speak about their experiences. So far, they, they say they're well prepared from, uh, for college and university study. Recognition of our school has also, has also come from the College Board, Connecticut Magazine, and other organizations. The advocacy group CONCAN honored Wilton High School as the number two school in the state with respect to overall student performance. That's measured as the average percentage of students meeting state goals across all subjects. Per pupil expenditures. There's been a lot of talk lately about Wilton's per pupil expenditures and why they've risen faster than comparable districts in recent years. There are several factors unique to Wilton that may have contributed to this. Several years ago, we increased staffing for our literacy initiative in grades one through five. The cohort results that I showed earlier are evidence that this has been a successful initiative. After the severe budget reductions of the 90s, we have had to rebuild our technology infrastructure. We had to rebuild our medical insurance reserve after it was depleted by the insurance crisis we experienced in 2000. Despite these factors, this slide shows that Milton actually spends less per pupil than most other towns in our area. As I stated earlier, the Board of Education has made every effort to be as transparent as possible during the budget process. All Board of Ed meetings are broadcast live on Channel 78. Videos of them are on the website. The budget class size, testing reports, technology report are all on the website. And these were all reviewed in the fall of the last year. Uh, questions on the Board of Ed and the Board of Finance and staff responses are on the, the website. I think we ended up with 139 questions, perhaps a record this year. Uh, we've had numerous budget study sessions uh, with our board and with the Board of Finance. These have all been televised. I also want to assure you that the members of the Board of Education, the administration, and the staff take very seriously our responsibility to provide little children with the quality education and provide, and provide value to the taxpayer. As you've seen and heard from the information provided in this presentation, we are a high-performing school district that has quality faculty, staff, students, and an involved community. In closing, I want to quote from the Tri-State Report presented to the Board of Ed on, on October 21st, 2010. And I quote, the Wilton community has a right to be proud of high performance of the high-performing school system. Students in Wilton are surpassing national, state, and local expectations in all areas, including the English language arts, due to committed, student-centered teacher, and administrators, a powerful leadership model, and a generous parent and community support. Thank you all for supporting your high-performing school district. Thank you, Gil. Uh, now call the board chairman's chairman of the Board of Finance to present a motion. And then after that, we'll have discussion. Mr. Moderator, I'm pleased to make a motion to recommend to the annual town meeting the appropriation of a budget for operating expenditures amounting to $112,134,479 for fiscal year 2012 and to levy a tax of 20.85 mills on the net taxable grant list of October 1, 2010 as set out in the public notice. Accordingly, I so move. Is there a second? Second. And we're not going to vote on it now because that's what's going to happen out in the lobby after we conclude the discussion. Uh, now, in the discussion period, many of you signed up and you came in indicating that you wish to speak. And I'll just mention this is an opportunity for you to express your views we don't want you to get into a debate with people up front, but please do address your questions to the members of the boards up in front of you. Also, please be respectful of the other speakers. You may not agree with them, but uh, we all live in the same town and we want to be respectful to each other. And finally, we did, as you remember, set a time limit of three minutes for each speaker. So I'm going to go down the list and uh, Ask you to come forward, use the microphone on one side or the other, up near the front. And the first name on the list is Deborah McFadden. Deborah McFadden, Westport Road. I'd like to thank everybody who is here this evening, particularly the members of the Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen, and Board of Education for their service. And I'd also really like to acknowledge 
the employees of the town and the school for their excellent service to our community. I support the budget as presented. I am concerned about the impact on the cuts long term, particularly to our uh, Board of Education budget. I'm also concerned about the deferred maintenance both in our schools and in our town and what that ramification is going to be down the road. I appreciate the increased funding for the senior uh, tax abatement program. It's important we do all that we possibly can to keep our seniors in the town of Wilton. They're a valuable asset to our community. I encourage the board of selectmen to do more in terms of economic development to prudently build our tax base. And as I mentioned in last year's meeting, I think it would be a great idea if we had a committee for uh, grant applications where appropriate and for gift giving to the uh, community. I also encourage more regional cost savings, as has been mentioned, whether it's through SCORPA or other vehicles. I think that that's an excellent avenue to pursue. I applaud the results we've had with our energy committee and encourage continued efforts in this area. And once again, I'd just like to thank everybody for their service in such a difficult economic year, and I urge all present to vote for this budget as presented. Thank you. Uh, next name, Patty Temple. Fondness for educators as I have two sister-in-laws who are teachers and one brother-in-law who's a retired principal. That being said, I am compelled to vote too high on the budget, specifically the Board of Education portion of the budget, because it is not a sustainable budget and of how little of the funds go to our students, programs, and services and facilities. Seventy-two plus million dollars is an exorbitant amount of money for four schools and slightly more than 4,000 students. And when only 18% of that figure goes toward our students, programs, services, and facilities, I think something's wrong. Before the most recent financial meltdown, the economy took a significant downturn in 2010, 2001, 10 years ago. A lot of people's portfolios were severely hurt. In 2003, the Connecticut Post was reporting articles such as schools face financial dilemmas. Two years ago, in 2009, the American Association of School Administrators devoted 14 hours of its three-day annual conference to managing school systems during a tough economy. School districts all over the state and country have been making relative adjustments over the past 10 years, tightening their budgets and increasing the efficiency of their spending Yet in, same, yet in those same 10 years, Wilton has just mostly increased spending. I understand unfunded state and federal mandates, but students, programs, services, and facilities should not be what is sacrificed in order to accommodate them. The financial operating model has been one of putting the cart before the horse, committing to increasing employee compensation two and three years at a time in advance, yet only providing the town with a budget one year at a time. In the past 10 years, employee compensation has increased year after year after year. And the payroll has also expanded. If test scores were soaring and the curriculum and services were expanding, that would be something to celebrate, the increasing spending and compensation. But that is not been the case. There are ways to do better by our kids without increasing the tax burden for the entire town. First and foremost, there should be no more putting the cart off of course. Secondly, we can be more efficient with the existing funding. And third, we need to seriously leverage other sources of funding. Wilton Public Schools are the beneficiary of $100,000, sometimes $200,000 annually from the Wilton Education Foundation and the PTAs, which in those figures should not show up within the budget. And they should be the beneficiaries of this money. And not only should they be, but they should be we should leverage and grow these sources for more and greater funding. There are even additional smaller programs that we can grow and leverage, such as Stop and Shop's A-plus rewards program, Box Tops for Education, 
And you may say, well, that's nothing than a $72 million budget, and that's true at the moment. But they can be grown and they can be leveraged. You're and it should be. Close to your time limit here. Um, that I'll skip to. <laughs> Two words we hear a lot now are sustainable and efficient. Sustainable agriculture, efficient living, efficient energy. It's time we now have a sustainable and efficient budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Bailey, do you wish to speak? Uh, I'll say a few words on behalf of the library. Now. First, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance for the consideration that they've given the library's grant request. And then I'd like to thank all my fellow citizens who are coming out and attending the meeting tonight and to ask you, specifically on behalf of the library, to support the library's grant request. At the Wilton Library, we strive to serve all segments of the community, young and old. Our mission is to be a lifelong center of learning for the community, and we're not just books. In addition to the books, on any, any given day, you'll find live performances, presentations, meetings, and debates. We invite you to come into the library, see how well the facility is being utilized, get together with your fellow citizens and learn something, and we ask you to support our budget request. I assure you, we cannot continue to do what we're doing with any less. Any less would mean a reduction of services. And we think if you come into the library and see what, you'll, see what we're doing, if you've utilized our services, you'll see that's not a good thing for the town. So we ask you to support the library's grant request. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Our next name is Gary Gerard. <laughs> Gary Gerard, Muscan Ridge Road. I have two topics. Um, I think these are both from Mr. Brennan. One has to do with economic development. We've seen again here tonight the grant list is not growing. It hasn't been growing. I'd like to know what's being done for economic development efforts in the town. As I read it, the plan of uh, conservation and development calls for appointment of an economic development committee. Has that been done? The town has participated in a, an initiative which is a regional initiative called One Coast, One Future. And this is an organization that started several years ago to combine the activities of economic development across 14 communities from Greenwich to Bridgeport. Strategies have been developed. Um, the initiative has gained momentum. There are specific projects. You're part of that. And the theory is that areas that are cooperating regionally are the areas that are growing in the United States. Last night at the Board of Select meeting, I had um, Paul Temporelli, who is President and CEO of the Bridgeport Economic Council. Uh, he attended our meeting. I encourage you to take a look at the, uh, the tape version of our meeting last night where he made a presentation on this subject. And it was a, I think it was very, very impressive. The town of Wilton has a pretty good record of economic development. And you compare where we are right now compared to other towns. We've increased our share almost 2% over the last several years. And it's been primarily along the Route 7 corridor. That is where the town's plan of conservation and development calls for economic development. If you drive around Wilton, you will not see any open prairies. We do not have a lot of potential land to develop. Most of the economic development is coming from really redos of existing buildings, knockdowns, new structures, and um, We've had several major projects along Route 7 that have added over 2 million square feet of Class A office space. Now, I know that it would be very nice to have a switch that we could just click and say, we'll hit this switch and we'll have instant commercial development that will take up 
take us from around 13% of our present um, grand list to 20%. I can assure you it will not happen. It just simply isn't enough land to do it. But economic development is a primary objective of this community, and it is usually location-specific. And when you have things that are location-specific, you also have people that are against it for that location. We have a good example of Cannondale, a classic area that we'd like to see some development take place. But there are many people, residents, uh, who have other feelings about it. So it's not as easy as you might think. The Board of Selectmen right now is going through a process, we discussed it last night, of reviewing. I've done research from several communities. I have the economic development plans of about seven communities that we were able to obtain through um, one of the, um, the, the Connecticut uh, Conference of Municipalities. And the Board of Selectmen will be reviewing these different plans to see what fits for Wilton. Our plan is not to just dive in and just form a committee and have the committee scurrying around. We've already talked to some other towns that have done that, and it doesn't produce results. We want to be, obviously, continue our activity in the one coast, one future, because it's regional and there's very, very valid reasons for participating in that. But we also want to have our own plan that is uniquely um, developed for Wilton and that we are going to develop our strategy for that and we want to do it right. And it must be consistent with our plan of conservation and development. Jerry mentioned our plan of conservation development. It's an excellent plan. It's the best plan of conservation and development that we've ever put together. So we've got to be, we've got to be mindful of that. And we want to continue to uh, do the development that will make sense for Wilton. But I can assure you that it, one, it takes time, it's got to be strategized, and we intend to do what we think would be best for Wilton, and that's a major project that we've commenced now for the next several months to, to get our plan together. Thank you. I think it needs to be a priority. The plan is now several months old. Yeah. The committee has been called for months ago, so whatever you can do, oh, I, I agree with you, Jerry. We, we do have this as a priority, and uh, we discussed it last night, and we will be discussing this in the coming uh, months as we try to pull this together and try to determine how we're going to do it for Wilton. But I share your comments. While you're up there, uh, my other topic quickly is roads. What is the overall plan for the repaving of roads? Mr. Thurkettle does a fantastic job with a very small budget. I commend him, but I've been trying to address Muskie Bridge Road in particular for at least four years. We've had grass growing through the cracks on that road. Now, as I wrote to you in a note recently, Norwalk has an overall plan for all the roads in the city. Apparently, a consultant came in you know the exact year when certain roads are going to be repaid. I'd like to know what is the strategy of the plan, uh, how you decide which roads will be repaid, and is Musket Ridge one of them? Okay. Uh, let me tell you about our roads. They're in bad shape. If you didn't notice last winter, we had a tough winter. And our roads have deteriorated in many areas. When you have a lot of expansion, cold weather, warm weather, the roads start to crack. We've increased the budget, uh, what we could, with what we were dealing with this year up to $675,000. Now, what our plan is, we can only pay so many roads. And we've got a lot of potholes and a lot of things to fix. And we don't have enough money to do it all. So we try to put priorities on roads that are the heavily used roads. If your road is a very small road and it's a cul-de-sac, it doesn't get the attention and focus that it was if it's Sturgis Ridge or if it's Belden Hill Road, because these roads are heavily used and as a result they deteriorate quickly. But Tom Turkell, he's got basically a five-year plan. He's got certain roads that he's, we've identified. These are the roads that we're hoping to pay each year. We know exactly what we're going to do each year. Now I'm going to talk about a little plan that, that I've been gathering information on, and it may be controversial. I did a survey of all the 14 communities in the Fairfield County area, and one of the questions I asked them is, how do you handle the financing and repaving and really the um, repair of those? And it came back as a real surprise. We, as you know, we 
do not bond for this type of expenditure. We feel it's an expenditure. We ought to expense it in the year that we're doing the paper, rather than paying for it over a number of years. But I was really surprised to find that this eight of the communities that I surveyed use various types of bonded programs in order to repair uh, and repave their roads. I'm not talking about uh, some communities that you've never heard of, but I'm talking about New Canaan, I'm talking about Stanford. New Canaan just had a vote on it. Yeah, so we have a lot of communities that have plans, and some of these plans, because their roads deteriorated, they come up with a five-year plan where they put a million dollars in, they bond a million dollars to make repairs over a five-year period. Um, two or three towns do something like that. Some towns do bond, and they do operating uh, expenses. So every town has a little different plan. I'm convinced that our roads uh, have gotten to the position that we are going, we're playing catch-up now, we're getting behind, that we've got to do something a little more dramatic. But I want to have enough evidence to say this is in a wild scheme and it's inappropriate. So we're going to be, it's going to be a subject the Board of Selectmen will be discussing because it's not going to happen this year, but we're going to try to come up with some kind of a plan that, that really addresses our roads and sees how we can repay or more specifically um, rework some of these roads. We've got serious uh, repair work that needs to be done. So I, I share your feeling. Um, I'm a bike rider, I go out, I see a lot of our roads are in, you know, deteriorating in different places. Tom Turkhead does a terrific job of doing as much as we can and stretching as much as we can. But we simply don't have the resources to go out and do every road that's got some potholes in it. We just simply don't. We try to repair them. When a letter comes in from any uh, citizen, we take that letter, it immediately gets put on a list for repairs if we need to fill a pothole. It doesn't maybe happen the next day, but it's goes right on the list. The letter has certainly been referred to, to, uh, to our DPW department. So if I contact Tom, you can tell me exactly when the Musket Bridge will be repaved. I don't know. I probably doubt that he has Musket Bridge on his program. But he, if he has Musket Bridge in the next five-year program, he'll tell you where it is. If it isn't there, it's not there. If it isn't there, we're in big trouble. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Next name on the list, Heather Rokaskas. Heather Rokaskas, 11 Fox Run. And I wasn't planning on addressing roads, but living on Fox Run, I've been there 14 years. It's never been repaved. I don't think it was repaved any time before I even got there. So you'll hear from me too on roads. Um, I just want to say that when I think about the taxes that my family pays, I think of the gratitude that I have to all of you for what I get for my tax dollars. I have two kids being educated in the schools. I get fire protection. I get the police department. I get snow plowing. I get a beautiful community with a long, deep history. And so I thank you for all that you do to protect that. I absolutely support the Board of Selectmen portion of this budget. I don't think that can be cut any further. And we also support the Board of Ed portion of the budget as it stands. A lot has been made this year about teachers and negotiations and contracts and lack of transparency and all of these things that I think are a distraction this year. Our teachers are compensated under a contract that was negotiated in good faith by all parties years ago. The world has changed since then, but it was negotiated on all sides, it was arbitrated, and there are things the community cannot know about those negotiations legally. So I don't think we can charge our town officials with lack of transparency <coughs> on this issue. Uh, I don't think our teachers are overpaid. If you look at what they are paid compared to other districts, they are not earning any more than anybody else. They are the key to our high-performing district. So I want to say my family supports this budget and we support our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next name on the list, Dean Keister. I'm Dean Keister, uh, Ridgefield Road. I've been a 
taxpayer for over 20 years. Unfortunately, my wife and I do not have any kids in the school. But I've been happy to pay because it does good for the community. However, when I saw the Board of Education presentation tonight, I got the feeling that we were paying for outstanding. And I, quite frankly, would be happy with very, very good. I've recently become one of those people on a fixed income now, having retired at 68. But if I could just have my mill rate freeze, I'd be much happier than having this uncertainty, but I know that it's going to go up year after year because the school budget is going to go up year after year. And it doesn't seem like there's anything to appease so many of the parents who want to have everything possible rather than just a lot of great programs. It seems that if something's left out of the budget, everybody gets upset. I signed up because I was so incensed with the rhetoric that went on last year. And what stuck in my mind last year was a woman decrying the travesty that her third grader could not have Mandarin Chinese in her class because the budget was so decimated. And that's why I signed up this year. It sounds a lot better this year, but it still seems like if we aren't number one in every category, that's not good enough for our town. So maybe I need to move to a place where being maybe second best is still pretty darn good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alex Rustowicz. And the next name after that will be Gail Moscow. So just... First thing, first thing, Bob, I was amazed at your initial comments. It just reminded me that's probably where the earmarks came for the pork projects in Congress. Uh, the other thing, I, Alex Ruskevich, Allen Road. One of the things I've heard is I've heard a lot of people say we should have more development. I just recently had a case not too far in a neighboring town. It's Cobbs Mill Inn. One of the reasons they closed because the taxes were too high. They could not afford to keep a restaurant there. You have to understand that people, if they're going to come in for development, they look at what they're going to have to pay in taxes. It's a cost-benefit analysis. The other thing, I just recently read an article in the Sunday Times which highlighted the fact that Weston has now become economically non-competitive to other towns. This wasn't my opinion. It was a real estate agent in Westport who said how much better Westport was doing as opposed to Weston. And the property values dropped because of it. So with those points, I would like to ask, how are other towns doing in their raising of their mill rate this year? That's pretty much all I have to ask. Does anybody have that information? Sorry. Do you have any information? We have it, but not here. Oh. I'll just. Uh, we have gone over that information, I think, uh, at the public hearing. Um, we are probably at the high end, but not the highest of all the towns around. And I do, we do have the numbers, Alex, but not here. So we'll have. Yeah, I just want to. I think I've heard that, but I wanted. The rest of the people are going to some of the meetings. So it would be just useful if it was put out somewhere on one of the websites, perhaps in the presentation, so that everybody can look at it and see how we compare to everybody else. Okay, Gail Moscow. Next name will be Ed Pass. Gail Moscow, 16 Carriage Road. We've lived in Wilton for more than 40 years. When our children were in school, there were many seniors, probably all of the seniors at that point, who more than willingly paid their taxes so that our children could get a good education. Now that I'm a senior and our children are gone, I am more than happy 
to pay my taxes so that other people's children will have the quality education that our children have. I hope other seniors feel the same way, and I urge support for the budget as presented here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ed Pack, 28 Walnut Place, here in Wilton. Uh, what I'd like to do first is to extend on my appreciation to the library. I think they've done an outstanding job with slim and narrow resources. A great resource to the town. I wish we could extend your management skill to the rest of the boards. Vote for another increase, the third increase during the worst economic recession in 60 years. It is an assault on our most vulnerable citizens. We have 500 senior citizens who are living on Social Security or fixed incomes and living below the national poverty. Each of you are responsible to putting an added burden on these 500 people. Where I come from, that's a city. It's unfair and unjust. And a meager 3% increase for these vulnerable citizens doesn't cut it. Doesn't cut it at all. Our budget has gone up. It's doubled in 10 years. Double in 10 years. Your charts don't show them. But that's the fact. Town income, as measured by the median household income, is up 34%. We citizens, even those who have a job, can't keep up with your spending. We can't do it. You're over the top. A letter went out the other day from the Board of Education to all of the parents, talking about a 23.5% reduction in teachers. That's misleading. Three years ago, there were 13 more teachers, not 23. Those are your statistics from your report. I don't know why you want to mislead them. I don't know why the first gut reaction every time we hear from the Board of Education is we're going to cut teachers. When we have 39 more staff members than teachers. You have 330, I believe it's 339, I'm sorry, 313 non-classroom employees. That's a lot. That's 40%. That's like 20% more than teachers. I don't think that cuts it either. So when you talk about reducing the town education budget, what you really should be looking at is the overhead fact, not the classroom. We've done a poor job over the years in managing our relationships with the union. It's up for renewal. Now's your chance to, to go back and get something that's equitable for all of us so we can afford it. Mr. We Conner, can't sustain it near the end of your time. Is this better? Yes. I'm Jacqueline Bain at 264 Old Drummond Hill Road. Um, I also would like to thank both the Board of Education and the Board of Finance for their service. Um, still to this day, I cannot believe you guys aren't paid. I know that all the emails you answer of mine, the ones that I send you, is enough to, to um, give you a full-time job. So I very much appreciate the work. Um, and I want to say that really, I'm coming here today to support your budget. And I'm supporting your budget not for any other reason that it's a practical thing to do. I've been coming to these meetings for three years, and 
asking, actually it started coming to these meetings in 2008, 2009 time frame, end of 2008, 2009. And what I didn't understand at that point in time, because I'm compensation now, so I would get up and ask questions like how much are your average increases, and you give me answers, next year I go back and go backwards and do the math, and I'd say, hey, we gave a lot more than that, and I couldn't understand it, so I've educated myself along the way. And only today, I realized that we're always arguing over just the little things because you come back to us every year and say, we can't argue over that because that's a state, that's a state obligation or that's some contractual obligation. I hear this every year, contractual obligation, contractual obligation, contractual obligation. Well, and then I say, and I get up at a town meeting and ask, how can I weigh in on these contractual obligations? And I'm told that I can't. Well, I found out in the last few weeks that I can. We all can. We all can weigh in on the union negotiations. And that's the only place, you know, with this, with our Board of Education being over $70 million and 68% of that being wages and benefits, the only way we can make a difference in this town as far as where we spend it and make sure that our spending dollars go towards services and things for our community is to make sure that we better manage the, the bulk of, of our expenses, which are these wages and benefits, which means the union negotiations. We have a right as town citizens to vote when they publish this, when they, when they, when they are supposed to file this with the town, whenever a, a, teacher's a teacher's union negotiation and the administrators, they have a union as well. These are the, the two most expensive, expensive, costly unions in our town. But they haven't given us that opportunity. In fact, from the, from the school board today, I got an email basically stating, this is exactly what it stated. This contract, um, the 2009-2012 teacher contract, this was a contract that was reached through stipulated arbitration agreement between the board and the teachers union. Our council has written that under the law, the Board of Education need not and may not submit this agreement to the town. This is, a, this is binding as written. We cannot find evidence that we have sent this town a copy of this agreement. And that means that, that our, our town didn't get it. It did not get published in the paper. We did not, as citizens, have our 30 days to go ahead and reject or approve this contract. The only way going forward getting close to the end that we will time. be able to make a difference is to understand these and weigh in on these contracts. Because the rest of it, you guys do perfectly well. I mean, you guys are so efficient. It's just with the union negotiations that you are not. I, I will approve this budget because there's no point in not approving it. Amy Harris. Hi, Amy Harris, 67 Wilton Cross. I too want to thank all of you for your service to our community. Thank everybody here for coming uh, for town meeting. In that spirit of uh, gratitude to the community, the PTA is giving away hot dogs on Friday during the adjourn vote from 11 to 2. Please come on by and have a hot dog. The root beer and the water service are a dollar each. Come by and have a hot dog. Thank you. Maybe it's Saturday. Maybe Saturday. Maybe I think you meant Saturday. Or maybe we'll show up Friday and see what happens. I'll say Walter Chris, not. Not yeah, you, right. Mr. Paul. You're on the list, Mr. Chris. Oh, that's right. Somebody else. Thank you, Walter Chris, 142 Earl Bud. Um, I'm encouraged by something I heard this evening that I think will, will really address some of our sustainability long term, and that is to really work diligently to get natural gas deeper into this community. Since in the south end of this community, it is right at, uh, at Wolf Pit. I've actually had discussions as well, just as a curious uh, person to find out that it's roughly $300 to $350 per foot to put in and extend that gas pump up Route 7. It's approximately 9,000 feet up to the schools, which are one of the major users of energy in this community. That'll take us right past downtown as well. And we'll have added benefits. I wouldn't expect it to get everywhere within this community, but I encourage you to do everything possible to accelerate the efforts to get natural gas deeper into our community. The cost per third or per unit of heat versus where oil is today is approximately 40%. And I think long term, maybe it won't be 40%, but it's likely to be substantially below oil. And um, so anything you can do with that public private partnership, I would encourage you, if you need to use bonding capacity to come back to the town to uh, propose that, uh, 
as appropriate. And lastly, and along with that, if you can keep these 50,000 pound oil trucks off of our streets, you'll have to do less with paving. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The next name is somewhat baffling. It's somebody named Paul, who I think lives on Thunder Lake Road. I should have known it was an honor. Paul Burnham, uh, 239 Thunder Lake Road. Um, first of all, I just want to say that I support the budget. But the real reason why I'm here is to object rather strenuously to the ordering of the speakers. We are here to have a dialogue between ourselves as a town, as a town meeting. And I think that the idea of having to sign up uh, beforehand, not knowing who you're going to speak before, not, not knowing who is going to speak after you, is not, um, uh, it's not uh, conducive to a dialogue. And we, we changed this about three years ago. I would encourage us strongly to go back to the system we had for many years prior to that. Mr. Uh, historian probably can tell us when we uh, first had town meetings in this town, but I'm sure that it's only in the last three years that we had to sign up before we were allowed to speak. Thank you. Well, we had first town meeting in 1802. <laughs> And I was not here. <laughs> and as far as being able to come back and speak later, we will allow chances after everybody on the list has gotten their chance. So if you wish to make a rebuttal speech a little later on, we'll give you an opportunity. Mr. Paul, your name is now on the list. I'm going to bore a milk pole, 417 Hurlbut Street. I'm going to bore everyone with some statistics, but I think we really have to take a fresh look. Uh, comparing 2012 to 2011 or to 2010 really doesn't give you a measure of what's going on in the town. Uh, I uh, was able to uh, get some statistics from the new uh, census, and they're uh, very interesting. Uh, one thing I'll point out is that we have a very peculiar town. Uh, again, this is by my definition, but 60% uh, uh, of the people in town I consider wealthy. Wealthy, by my definition, is an income of 150,000 or more. 18 percent are, you might say, scraping by, and I don't mean that as an insult. And that's uh, with incomes below 74,000, which is probably uh, difficult in this town. Now. Uh, also, according to statistics, there are uh, 2,266 families with children under 18 in town. And uh, that represents 39% of the households. But according to my figures, those households absorb more than 90% of the tax dollars. Now, why is that important? It's important for several reasons. Now, first of all, it isn't a set of circumstances which can continue because you can't force people to live in Wilton. And as alternate housing is developed, in surrounding towns, and there are dozens of them, the people without children are going to move into them, where they have ground floor apartments. The rents, the rents are 
uh, costs are half, they have swimming pools and all the other things that these developments have. And you have to, what's going to happen, if we continue to do what we're doing, the people without children are going to vacate Wilton, and then costs will really escalate, or class side will go up much, much more. Now, I, a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, I made a study, instead of taking one year or two years or three years, I studied 2000 to 2010. And actually, the comparison is a little worse now. In other words, we've had less of an inflation this year, uh, and uh, so the number of taxing units in Wilton in 2000, and in 2000 was 6,006 and 19. In 2010, it was 6146, up 2.1 percent. Mr. Paul, you've run, you've run over time, but I'll let you come back later. I said you've run over three minutes, but I'll let you come back later after the others have had a chance. Not, how, how much longer do you have right now? Yeah, I prefer you sit down for a couple minutes. We have two more speakers that have signed up. Next name is uh, Doug Cutler. Mr. Cutler, what did you know? Somebody in the back row. And then after that is Boone Foster. If Boone Foster's in the back row, she can start walking forward. Okay, Mr. Cutler. Uh, Cutler, 221 Danbury Road, also 24 Danbury Road. I'm a landlord, and I have about eight tenants, and they're all struggling except one. And I would encourage the board members to perhaps go and visit the small businesses in town and get a, get a perspective from their point of view. Uh, I think it's plain to see that there are many empty buildings in this town, and I hear rumors of some, some foreclosures. It's all well and good to educate our kids. However, if our parents and kids have to go overseas to find work, and we can't get work on our own, in our own community, in our own state, you know, what, so what good is it going to do? I think there has to be more shared pain across the board. I know we have fuel increases. I'm somewhat suspect of that, of that uh, statistic on pay increases. Certainly many principals have taken a 50% cut. Uh, there's many freelancers. There's many small businesses that are feeling a tremendous amount of pain from this cataclysm. And I think it needs to be sort of looked over again. Uh, so I hope to hear from some of the board members and on behalf of some of my tenants and my fellow small business people, I hope they will hear from them too. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Doon Foster. Hi, Doon Foster, 71 Old Belton Hill Road. Um, you guys, you're crazy. Um, so that's my thank you. Um, I don't know why you do it. I truly don't. Never have. Um, I've been 20, over 20 years in the town. I would like to say that I do support the budget. I um, would like to speak as one parent. I put in, um, my daughter is a junior. I have spent all her years in the school system working for the PTA and working in the classroom with teachers. I just welcomed on Saturday night at midnight um, 300 of our students home from a band trip. Um, the parents who went on that trip, the administrators and the teachers who went on that trip, these teachers are doing so much with, um, I'm not going to say so little, um, but they are working their hearts out for our kids and no one wants to see seniors leave the town. That is not anyone's intention. I don't think it's a 
anyone's intention here in the audience or up on this stage. Um, that's part of the strength of our community. Um, and yet, those children need our help and support. Um, we have gotten our education, we have gotten our jobs, and it's our duty to provide for them, not a crazy amount, and I think if you go into the schools, you will see that it is not a crazy amount. Um, there is plenty of opportunity to speak to your point. Um, I think there's more than um, one opportunity to uh, contribute to the town. It's the, at the PTA, it's to volunteer to do one of these thankless jobs. Um, but I just want to say I support the, um, the seniors and the parents and the budget. Thank you.